some would argue it wasn't. I'm not here to discuss the bombing of Dresden. Listen to what I'm getting at. So in the bombing of Dresden, they say that rather than breaking the will of the German people, it actually didn't. And the reason was, historians say, is that the reason the German people, their will wasn't broken by the firebombing of Dresden and hundreds of other German cities, incidentally, was because, quote, they were more afraid of their government than they were of the Allied bombers. So in other words, they'd rather live to see their own children emoliated by a firebombing and say nothing about that, I mean, rather than criticize their own government, because they were so afraid of Hitler's government. That's why I detest big government. And that is why I detest centralized power. That is why I fear Obama and the Chicago gang. That is why I detest all big, big government types. And that's why you should, too. I'll be right back. Your money, your life. How to make sense of it all. I'm Rob Black. Join me weekday mornings at 10 on Talk 910 KNEW. Queen of England actually reads the New Yorker. I don't blame her. I hope that when she does, I mean, I've always been a fan. I've been an Anglophile all my life. Sometimes for the wrong reasons, but maybe when she reads the real Michael Savage on a shock jock's unexpected side of the New Yorker, she will relent. You know, I don't even know if she's allowed to involve herself in government, even if she knows she has morons running things. I think there's a separation there of church and state, so to speak. So here we are, one eight hundred four four nine eight two five five michaelsavage dot com, whatever. Daytona Beach Joe, you're on the Savage Nation. Go ahead, please. Hey Mike, I was waiting yesterday to see what happened. You were supposed to let the cat out of the bag on on who else was with you on that list. And right. That's right. We found all the emails. They're very damning of Jackie Smith's decision to link me up with murderers and terrorists. There is one telling email where she says the following, and I, I don't have it in front of me, the letter, <clears throat> but not that she says. One of the staffers, they're discussing whether to include Michael Savage on the list. They actually had a long discussion about it. And one of the in one of the emails, uh, one of them says it could cause us trouble if the others are not listed along with him. So right now we're going to the next level of legal work. We want to know who the others are. What do they mean, the others? Well, who are the others? Talk show hosts? What do you mean, others? Other what? You were implying last time, last week, when you said, you know, there was other people on the list, too. That well, you, we think there are. There may be other talk show hosts listed. We don't know. We're trying to find that out. It's very expensive. I went to Thank you for the call. Chicago, Eric, you're on the Savage Nation. Yes, Dr. Savage, I have the uh, perfect character that I believe uh, represents yourself, or you represent the character. Go ahead. Uh, Sopranos, episode two, he was the, the black, uh, Reverend James Sr. Uh, Tony had visited to see his son, and the father was there. Oh, he was a great character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he, he, he then one of his last, uh, uh, statements to Tony was, never underestimate a man in his quest for freedom. Of course. Yeah. Funny. Oh, I loved him. He appeared only once, right? The son was like a, a like a reverend who was on the take working with the corrupt councilman, right? Correct. Correct. But the father was the old line, rock ribbed, honest black preacher type who you couldn't bend if you try to bend them with a with a blowtorch. Yep. Yep. He was laid back, but he could attack with his his words, his mind, his wisdom. Uh, you know. He was a lovely. He was a wonderful character. It's interesting how you bring that up. I mean, I was thank God you didn't say I reminded you of Burt Young in that in that one. <laughs> you remember Burt Young? I, I I think Burt Young is one of the best character actors in the history of the mafia, you know, kind of movie. I loved him going back to the seventies when he used to wear the fedoras and the bell bottom pants. In fact, Burt Young was in the Pope of Greenwich Village as the guy in the in the in the uh, in the club. Remember? Yes, yes. And where in the end, uh, uh, Mickey Rock poisons him with arsenic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny. But Burt Young's best role is when he plays the barber with uh, emphysema who comes back out of retirement from Florida to do one more uh, murder. 
and they sent him out to kill his godson, Mustang Sal, who had uh, killed a guy with a uh, uh, crippled a guy with a, with a, a golf club. Remember that? Yeah. Astounding yeah. movie. I mean, I, that the orchestration of that is amazing. Yeah. Thank you for the call. See that the problem is this: after all the years of following The Sopranos and talking about it on the show, you would think if there was real freedom in the arts that a character like me as a talk show host would have been written into one of the series because, for a lot of reasons, it would have brought them a lot of audience. But you've got to understand that most of these people are so far to the left. They may be very talented marionettes. But as you can see with Nurse Jackie, with a very talented actress, the woman is a pinhead. In the, in the truest sense of the word, she's a microcephalic. Edie, whatever her name is, Falco. I mean, I thought more of her. You start to think she plays... This wise wife in New Jersey, you know, and she is that. But you could see in, in Nurse Jackie when she was promoting it, the thing she said was so so shallow that it was almost pathetic. It, it bordered on the path on the pathetic. Anyway, don't don't call me about that. That's all. One eight hundred four four nine eight two five five. George, New York City, W O R. You're on the Savage Nation. Topic, please. Uh, uh, fire hydrants in New York during hot summers. Thank you. It was real, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And you guys must have been rich because we used to use a two by four and two coat hangers. Wait a minute. You, you lost me. A two by four and two coat hangers to do what? To wrap around the nut on the top of the hydrant to open it up. <laughs> oh, you mean you kids opened it up by yourself? Yeah. Well, yeah. our fathers would get the pipe wrenches and do it. Yeah, well, our fathers didn't have them, so we had to improvise. That's funny. And the cops didn't arrest you, did they? Well, no. The neighborhood cop on the beat, he would come around, see us playing in the water. He would bang on the light pole with his nightstick and then put up his hand with five fingers. That indicated he would take five minutes to walk around the block, and then we had to get out of there and shut it down. Isn't that something? What a different world. What an incredible story that is. In other words, true tolerance existed in those days. I grew up on, uh, as a dead-end kid. I grew up in Chinatown on the Lower East Side. Oh, my God. That was rough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was a great education. I passed it on to my four sons. Yeah, and how did they do? Okay. Well, let's see. One did two tours of Iraq, and he came out a Marine Sergeant, and now he's with NYPD in Harlem. And the other mm. one was a Navy, a Navy medic seal. Wow. My God, you raised tough boys. Yeah. That's but you didn't one. raise them in the same uh, neighborhood, did you, George? No, no, no. We moved out to a very docile area called Queens. <laughs> Where in Queens did you move? Uh, Fresh Meadows. Unbelievable. And the kids were able what? You're talking when? I mean, what era did they grow up in? Uh, from, let's see, the youngest one was 1979. Amazing. But you were able to produce a Navy SEAL and an Iraq veteran out of, out of Queens, New York in the 70s? Yeah. Astounding. So you brought the values of your childhood to them, and no matter what was going on around them, you told them the right way, correct? Yes, correct. I have to give credit to my wife because it was a one-income family, so she stayed home. She pushed them like crazy for education and this, that, and the other. Well, remember, wait, wait, you remember I said last week, my mother, may she rest in peace, how she would lecture us about drugs in an offhanded, almost, almost theatrical way. She'd pick up the newspaper, the Daily News or whatever, and she'd look at about a story about a kid who became a junkie or this or that and drugs. She'd say to, like, to the wall, I don't know, she would say to the wall, to me, anyone who uses drugs is weak. What technique did you use to keep your kids away from drugs? I just told them, don't do two things. Don't bring anybody home with the police, and don't bring anybody home who's pregnant. With, with what? Uh, don't bring the cops home, and don't bring anybody home who's pregnant. Oh, who's pregnant. But what about drugs? Um, they See, knew. the drugs they are knew. the biggest scourge in America. Drugs, both legal and illegal, are the reason we have a nation that has been destroyed. Drugs destroyed America. Not only the, the street drugs... But the medical profession has destroyed the minds of this country. Everyone is told that they're crippled, that they're ill, they need a drug. And what it is, it's mind control. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if I could say one more thing real quick. If I was your next-door neighbor, you and I would be best friends. 
Thank God. I thought you were going to say the opposite. No, no. And if I had time, I would tell you about a wonderful dog story. Well, I want to hear what you grew up in Chinatown. Did you have to fight uh, the Tong gangs as a kid, as a white kid? No, I was accepted as the white token. I used to go to the dojo and the Chinese theaters, and I learned Oh, Mandarin. my God, what a lucky, what, what an upbringing. So you went into some of the underground theaters there and everything? Yes, absolutely. Oh, stay on the line. i got to hear more of this. Savage. Hi, we are Armstrong and Getting. We're on every weekday morning from 6 to 10. He is a national treasure. He is Dr. Savage on Talk 910 KNEW. So I see in the news today from the London Times that the uh, Obamas are staying in a $20 million house on Martha's Vineyard. That's to show you how careful he is about costs and cost containment. $20 million holiday home at Blue Heron Farms suits Barack Obama to a T. Nothing wrong with that. It's nice to say one thing and do another while you're, uh, you're, you expected something different. The choice of such an exclusive location will inevitably be 